All right, so we are going to start again. We are going to start again. Yeah, just uh <laughs> I don't know, like I don't know IBM, don't so know. yeah. I'll try. So I guess we need to get out of this one. Are you gonna be spinning my circuit? Uh no. <laughs> unless you want me to. Uh so we'll wait until you yeah. your pres <laughs> your presentation is uh so do you want do you wanna to come to the podium when yeah, yeah. Minutes. And I'm the. Uh, oh, I can, yeah. 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 <laughs> if, you can, if you can maybe give me the five minute. Okay, I have the two minute finger, but uh, I can do a, a five minute. Um, Okay, so we're going to start uh, again, and um, so following uh, Frank's presentation, we have now uh, two speakers, um, President Audrey Poitra and um, Jason Madden, uh, who is a lawyer with uh, Pape, Salter, and Taillé. So I'm going to present uh, both of them, and... Um, and then we'll have the same kind of uh, organization in the sense that, you know, they'll talk and then we'll take the Q&A and then afterwards uh, we'll eat. So Audrey Poitra um, is the Métis Nation of Alberta president and is one of the highest profile Métis women in Canada. Audrey was elected as the first female president in 1996. <laughs> becoming the long-serving president of uh, the longest-serving president of the MNA. Audrey has been a strong advocate for Métis rights and will continue to move the Métis rights agenda forward with the help of the Daniels Supreme Court decision in 2016. She has successfully negotiated partnerships with colleges and universities for Métis endowment funds of $22 million. She also oversaw the creation of the MNA's Rupert's Land Institute, Métis Center of Excellence, which is a unique partnership with the University of Alberta, promoting education, training, and research. Audrey is recognized within Alberta as a leader who is committed to helping build a better economic future for the Métis Nation. She has received numerous awards and achievement milestones through, throughout her leadership, including a National Aboriginal Achievement Award. Jason Madden is a managing partner of the law firm Pape Salter Taillé uh, with offices in Toronto and Vancouver. He is a graduate of Osgoode Hall uh, Law School and is called to the bar in Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, Northwest Territories and the Yukon. Almost all of Canada. <laughs> That matters. <laughs> <laughs> Jason is recognized as being at the forefront in the advancement of Métis rights in Canada. He has acted as legal counsel in many of the cases dealing with the Métis rights from Ontario westward, including Harvey Gooden, La Violette, Belle Humeur, and Hersey Corn. 
He has also appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada in all of the cases dealing with Métis rights issues over the last 15 years. Jason is currently legal counsel for the Métis Nation of Alberta, the Manitoba Métis Federation, and the Métis Nation of Ontario in their negotiations with Canada on Métis rights, land, and self-government issues. Jason is a citizen of the Métis Nation from Northwest Ontario and a descendant of the half-breed of Rainy River and Rainy Lake, who collectively adhered to Treaty Number no. 3 in 1875. So please welcome both Audrey and Jason. And they'll be talking about um, Scrip and the history of the m &A. Thanks again, Natalie. Good morning, everyone, again. So, we are here today because the Métis Nation is one of Alberta's Indigenous people. The territory in what is now Alberta was part of the Métis Nation's homeland for generations before settlers came west, and this province was created. This is still our homeland, and this will be our homeland forever. The rivers, the rivers, the rivers and the lakes, the forests and the prairies of Alberta help shape the Métis people. As a nation, we were born of the land and we continue to depend on Alberta's lands and resources. Many Métis citizens hunt, fish, trap and gather just as the Métis families always have. They put food on their tables, and they sustain their families. They help keep our culture alive. And I know that all Métis people, whether or not we are active harvesters, feel a deep connection to the territory. It is part of what makes us who we are. It has rarely been easy. We've had to fight for generations to have our rights to the land respected. When Canada expanded into the Northwest following Confederation, we were here. This is our homeland. We had a right to be treated as a nation. We had a right to be negotiated with as equals and to fair compensation for any lands that were taken from us. But Canada gave us only false promises and disrespect. When in October of 1869, a group of Métis, led by Louis Riel, chased Canadian surveyors out of Manitoba, they did it to defend our Métis lands. When weeks later, they declared the provisional government in Manitoba, they did it in order to negotiate for the protection of our lands. And they did negotiate for the protection of our lands. But Canada failed to fulfill its promises. The Métis were prosecuted, uprooted, and scattered. Canada moved across the prairies, making treaties with our First Nations cousins. But Canada did nothing for us. And in Alberta, the Métis began to organize way back then. In 1877, at Blackfoot Crossing, Métis petitioned Canada for assistance in settling land. In 1878, in the Cypress Hills, Métis petitioned Canada for a reserve. And in 1880, in St. Albert, Métis petitioned Canada to survey their lots. And do you know what Canada did? Nothing. Actually, Canada did worse than nothing. Canada opened the West for settlement and sold our homeland from under us. The situation was insufferable. We had to act, and we did. We resisted. In 1885, again under Riel's leadership, we declared a second provisional government. And that year, at Batoche, Canada tried to break us. They captured Riel, and after a kangaroo trial, they killed him. But we were still there, 
and Canada knew it. This is when they gave us script. Script, pieces of paper that offered nothing but false promises. Now reduced to coupons in our homeland, our collective inheritance was systematically brought, bought up by spectators and used to underwrite our own colonialization. But by the end of the century, Canada had reduced us to being squatters in our own homeland. We, the Otapimsoak, were now huddling on crown land on the fringes of settlers' development and white towns and being called the road allowance people. What did we do? Again, we organized. In 1897, Métis in St. Albert established the St. Albert Métis Association to advocate for the fair handling of Métis land claims and to petition Ottawa for improvements to the script system. In 1911, Métis from Lesser Slave Lake petitioned Canada to investigate the fraud that plagued the script system. And in 1920, Métis from Fort Chippewan requested that Canada establish a royal commission to investigate script fraud. And do you know what Canada did? And you heard it from Frank this morning. They changed the criminal code to make it impossible to, to prosecute script fraud. They changed the criminal code to protect the land speculators who swindled us out of our rights. At this time, Canada, not Alberta, had legal responsibility for the lands in the province. But this was about to change. At the end of the 1920s, Canada proposed to transfer responsibility for land in the Prairie Provinces to the provincial governments. Métis feared that this might be our last opportunity to have our rights to land protected. So what did we do? You guessed it, again, we organized. In 1928, led by Charles Delorme, we established the Association de Métis Alberta La Territories de Northwest. I'm not, a, I'm not much of a French person, so I can't speak it, but anyway, that's what it was. <laughs> to advocate for the rights of Métis living on Crown land. And four years later, in 1932, we organized more formally as the Métis Association of Alberta, now known as the Métis Nation of Alberta. The original Métis Association of Alberta had 31 locals across the province. They advocated to alleviate Métis poverty and the creation of a secure Métis land base in Alberta. And more than Métis in any other province, they succeeded. In response to Métis lobbying, Alberta appointed the Half-Breed Commission to examine and report on Métis rights, health, education, homelessness, and land issues. Judge Albert Ewing was appointed chairman, which is why this became known as the Ewing Commission. Joe Dion, Malcolm Norris, and Adrian Hope, founding members of the Métis Association of Alberta, consistently attended the commission's hearings. After a two-year investigation, the commission recommended that the province provide Métis with a secure land base. And that is what they did. In 1938, responding to pressure from the Métis Association of Alberta and the Ewing Commission of Alberta, Alberta adopted the Métis Population Better Act, Betterment Act, which created the province's 12 original Métis colonies, now known as the Métis Settlements, the only legally recognized Métis land base in the country. Yes, Alberta later rescinded four of those colonies, as you heard this morning. And no, the majority of Métis in Alberta do not live on the remaining settlements, but it was still a remarkable achievement and one of which we should all be very proud. 
Our fight, however, has had to continue. The wrongs of script have not been reconciled. Our rights to land beyond the borders of the settlements have not yet been recognized. Our rights as a nation have yet to be fully respected. Lately, though, we have had success. Our, on November 16, 2017, Real Day, we signed a framework agreement with Canada. Among other things, in this framework agreement, Canada does commit to negotiating a process for resolving our claims regarding script. Never, not once since the 19th century, had Canada acknowledged that we might have a claim to land. And now, Canada has agreed to sit down at a table and talk about reconciliation. We have come a long way, and we still have a long way to go. Over the next, these next two days, we will hear about many journeys traveled and the road ahead. I am very much looking forward to it. It is by championing our rights to our land that we will continue to build a strong Métis nation based on embracing Métis rights. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm going to try to provide some context on Métis script in Alberta Métis, and I want to get back to the point of organizing, because I think that I, I uh, well, my naivety of uh, youth has passed a long time ago, and the idea that Canada is going to negotiate on this or come around on this is just, I, I don't necessarily think that we're at that place yet. And I've always, uh, you know, been, you need to have a backup plan. I think in order to understand the backup plan and to organize and be prepared for what the hard road to come is, uh, is what we're, this conference is really about. But I do want to start with two starting points, and I think it's important because sometimes when we talk about self-government and harvesting rights and all of that, we, we ignore the fundamental component of land, and sometimes Métis tap dance around it too because we don't want to offend First Nations, and, uh, it, uh, and the settlers kind of goes, well, we got it fair and square through fraud. Um, <laughs> and I think we need to start with these two concepts. There will be, and, 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 I, and I think this needs to be embedded within our psyche, there will be no reconciliation with the Métis without dealing with the legacy of script. And second, addressing the Métis land issue is fundamental to any just and lasting settlement with the Métis. Recognizing our self-government and our ability to do right laws in certain areas without the corollary of a place for us is not on. And now, of course, progress, not perfection, all the time, and we need to advance the discussions and the recognition and overcome some of the fundamental issues. Frank talks about, well, none of these cases that you've been doing to date had anything to do with script yet. Right, we didn't, because the fundamental basis of what we've been in courts fighting on is, one, there is a Métis people, and two, they collectively hold rights, and you can't deal with them as individuals or less than First Nations or adjunct relatives of First Nations, or that our rights are derivative. But this all comes from, and I, I want to contextualize this because I think we're all susceptible to it, as a practitioner of quote-unquote aboriginal law, which for all intents and purposes is colonial law of, in relation to aboriginal rights. It is not indigenous law. And, and, and we always have to recognize that what the courts ultimately are, even though they're better than governments in some cases, they still are colonial courts. And they will only go so far. And calling out the sharp dealings or the outright um, fraudulent scheme that Western Canada is grounded upon and everyone's title sits upon, they will not call that out. Uh, and even, even if we finally do get an Indigenous judge in the Supreme Court of Canada, we may get a good dissent, but those ma the majority is, and colonization is still well in hand in this country. And we're all susceptible to it in all. I actually, as a, a, a practitioner, kind of run into these sorts of things. I don't know sometimes if I'm making it better or worse, but I think we have to talk about what 
colonization is. And I use the analogy of colonization being like a virus. It is a virus that infects and, and it rewrites code. And you, it's kind of like, don't open that email, right? And then you do, and then you, and then you got to go get a new Mac. It's like, uh, and, and and I think that we have to begin to understand it that way, and that, and we have to understand script as a part of the infection that continues today, and that continues to re, and and that the code hasn't been rewritten yet. In fact, we're still operating on, you know. Um, on some demon system that we we unfortunately opened. And I think we need to talk truths about our country and the fiction that is Canada in some ways, shapes, and forms. We The assumed sovereignty of the crown. We need to challenge that. And, it, it's, it, and we don't recognize sometimes that we're all, it's so deeply embedded in our education system. This map is just a perfect example, right? The grayed out area, right? Well, where it's all happening is Eastern Canada, where the four colonies originally in Canada are, and then, Sir John A. has this great idea to go westward and, and, and bring this area into confederation. The narrative of Canada is biased, one-sided, and it's a fiction. And I think that what we, what we are doing with reconciliation is trying to bring people along and trying to say, okay, but there's a different perspective here, and yours isn't necessarily right just because you've owned the market for the last 150 years and controlled it. And so these maps are uh, in still high school geography books today. And I want to I, I think this is, I, I, I want to highlight what we're saying today and what we see in the discourse today. This is what Riel says back in 1885. He says, when, Canada, when the government of Canada presented itself on our doors, it found us at peace. It found that the Métis people of the Northwest could not only live well without it, but it had a government of its own, free, peaceful, well-functioning, contributing to the work of civilization in a way the Company of England could never have done without a thousand soldiers. It was a government with an organized constitution whose junction was more legitimate and worthy of respect because it was exercised over the country that belonged to it. This is what he's writing in 1885, just about b before he's hung or executed by Canada. And what we also have to recognize is that the Métis are a people. They are a people. <laughs> that is why the groups popping up in the East are not a people. Show me your language. Show me your stories. Show me your assertion that didn't come 20 minutes after the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Pavley. That is not the history that is here. And the history that is here, and these are the criteria that are ba based on peoplehood. Territory, homeland, family, our own language, laws of the prairies, our, our relations with First Nations, citizenship and belonging, relationship to the land, dance, laws of the hunt, all of na national symbols in our flag. That's what makes the Métis a people and not an adjective. And so, and I think that we have to, and, and with peoplehood comes a right to land and comes all the same rights that are recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And we shouldn't shy away from that or be uncomfortable about asserting that. But it's based upon peoplehood and not based upon myths or based upon, um, you know, uh, I would say the Johnny come Matey assertions that we see from, uh, <laughs> pun intended. Um, so peoplehood, but that is what grounds and that is what roots. And then, and, and I, I just want to say this, I, I love Riel's writings in some ways. The Canadian government cannot become trustee of the Métis unless by consent of the people. Back in 1885, he's using the language of FPIC today, of free, prior, and informed consent. We know this. This is what is right. This is what is just. And because this consent had not been asked nor given, the Council of the Métis, their laws of the prairie, continued to be the true government and the true laws of that country as they virtually still are today. And that is what is the, the reality. And the fact is that virus may have infected us, but we can't re, re, uh, ignore. And in fact, we need to uncover and we need to take ownership of and we need to enhance and we need to teach and we need to do all of these sorts of things to reinvigorate those Métis legal orders. And, and because some of them have also been infected by colonization of our own making, but also we have to recognize that's what we're rooted on and that's what is the basis for asserting Métis rights as a people today. And this is what you have 
when colonization and facts. So no, you're no longer a people. You're no longer seen as a, you know as as a distinct group. You're it's dispossession of the land, Métis scrip, broken promises licenses and tags being imposed, external categorization. White people love categorizing indigenous people. Six ones, six twos, half breeds, half breeds who farm. It, in, the, in the materials that I've seen over the years, it's just shocking to me of how you need to, it, it's like they're, they're, I don't know, scientists identifying new butterflies, right? It's like, oh, you're these, you're these. And what they ignore is the people, the kinship and the relations that are actually there with the people, um, they they name us right. Naming is a great way. Maps are propaganda. So now you name them. They're no longer owners of their land. They're squatters. They're traders. They're half breeds, i.e., half of people. It's all a it's it's a it's a deliberate organized scheme of colonization, and it's effective. And what is fundamental to it is acquiring the lands from indigenous peoples. That's, that's its end game. It eats, it consumes people, it consumes resources, it consumes everything in its wake. And, um, and then they come in with the reign of terror, add on control, land surveys, and creating divisions between kin. And then what you see post-colonization is they erase you from the land, they create these new systems and, and structures through script. This is, so this is, I think, my home community of doing a kinship network, and no, no history is going to talk about it, the half-breeds of Treaty 3. This is how we were interrelated prior to the Indian Act being imposed upon us. And what, and what this shows is an amazing, beautiful networking kinship. And this happens up in northern Alberta, throughout the Métis Nation. And then what you start seeing is this. These are Indian Act Indians. These are non-treaty Indians. These are civilized half-breeds. These are half-breeds who are Indians. And it all of a sudden, and, and this is what happens to my family, my community, and I know you have it in yours. And to a certain extent, we adopt that nonsense. We are part of the problem in some ways by virtue of accepting the premise of these external systems that have been imposed on us. And trying to knock off the shackles of colonization ain't easy because sometimes you don't even know what is the virus anymore. I think though we need to talk about this as Métis people ourselves and what we're actually, are we doing harm or are we actually getting back to the authentic self? And this is peoplehood post-colonization zeros and ones it is the code has been rewritten that that water body that is we have known at, from our traditional names forever is now named after some white lady who's been there for 20 minutes because her husband is highly prominent in the community and all of a sudden those place names which connect to our language get erased and we struggle to hold on to them even because the prominent or the wave of colonization. I give this context because this is what you're fighting and, it, and it's challenging and you need to also know, if you don't know the history and you don't know what's going on, you're just going to be doomed to replace it and you can't develop strategies to fight against it. And then it's the game of after we've colonized, I love the minions, um, they, it's, it's this approach of we don't see you we don't see you as a people anymore because we've destroyed you as a people. And then, and so if we have to do anything with you, we'll de deal with you as individuals that may, because you're an adjunct relative of an Indian, or you have some sort of derivative claim that flows from what we will, ex who we accept has claims. And that is the way, whether it's union busting, whether it's uh, buffalo hunting, yeah, break up the herd. And it's, a, it's an effective tool of colonization, and that's what they do as well. And we have been fighting that for 150 years of, no, these are not individuals. These are, not, this, these are the same ways that you dealt with First Nations as collectives. You need to deal with the Métis as such, because they have all the attributes of it. So the Métis Nation's erasure from the maps in Canada is... Uh, one of I, I find maps, I, I really like maps. I, I should have been a geographer, Frank, but I really like maps because they're great propaganda. And more importantly, those maps have taken us off 
Canada's, uh, well, not Canada, but our, those homelands that we know are ours, we don't see ourselves in it anymore. So there, of course, we, we know where the historic treaties are. That's a very powerful map and some assumptions that come with it. And then, of course, this language map, we're nowhere seen on it in any way, shape, or form, even though there is a distinct language. And let's be clear, Michif is a distinct language, and that, that flows from peoplehood. Scholars have come from Germany and come and studied it and says, no, it's not just a bungee or it's not just a dialect of someone else. It is a distinct group that comes with peoplehood. And if you ever heard Norman Fleury, one of the, uh, uh, an amazing Machif speaker, he talks about it, not just that it doesn't just come from our peoplehood from a sociological perspective, but as a part of our origin story, we were given our language like other indigenous peoples were given our language as well. And of course, the Métis Nation's not on it. And then, and then even where those historic treaties are, First Nations and Inuit have been redrawing the map of Canada through negotiation of modern day land claims agreements. But the bias in this is, well, those prairies spoken for, taken care of already. Um, so I think, I, and I just think that we need to challenge these perceptions because we sometimes reinforce them and, we all, and we're also squeamish of challenging the maps of, or challenging statements that others may make. And I, and I don't think that we have anything uh, uh, that we should not be assert making those assertions. So Canada's dealing, and I, I, I wanna give this as a context because I think it helps frame some of the challenges about, well, what do Alberta Métis do? Because the one thing that I will say, is, and Frank does note this, is you, you have always petitioned about it. You are the ones who have created the record more than any other province about it. And, and I think that, that that speaks volumes and it also speaks to where you have to go next on this. So I'm gonna tell the story of, of, of Manitoba Métis because although it is different and section 31 lands are not script lands, but it sets the prelude of, like, of the, the policy which was you know, Canada's policy towards the Métis is whatever gets us through the day. Whatever lie we need to tell in this moment to acquire what we want, and then we will screw them afterwards. That is what the policy was. And in Manitoba, that's what they needed to do in 1869 and 70 to get through. There was no way through to build that railway without dealing with the Red River Métis, 12,000 people living in the rail Red River, 10,000 of them Métis, 7,000 of them children, and led by the charismatic, uh, an amazing Louis Riel. And, but what, what's more important is that the people themselves had organized. I, I'm always amazed by this history of, you know, this, these ideas of the assemblies. And I got to admit, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of assemblies. You got to have an appetite for the assemblies. But they, 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 um, it, but they come from this innate belief that Métis want to be heard. And even if they're nuts, which some of them are, and even if they're fighting with each other, which is A-OK, -okay, we believe in this concept of di direct democracy. And it's so deeply rooted back to the days of Riel. Riel had to go back to the convention three times to finally get the mandate where he could assert a provisional government on behalf of his people and negotiate. And he did it through persuasion, he did it through words, he did it through debate, and he did it through pe some people disagreeing with him. But that's A-OK. -okay. That's what a peoplehood is about, and that's what democracy is about. And, and so what the Métis in Manitoba in that small little postage stamp were able to do is get this constitutional promise from, Man from Canada. Section 31 in the Manitoba Act, the 1.4 million acres of land, which equates to in that little postage stamp, they would have had 12% of the land mass in there. And they said, look, if we have that, we know what's coming. They were not naive of like, you know, like da 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 da. They knew what was coming from the East. Everyone knew they were going to get swamped, and that's why they thought if we negotiated this, this would be when the wave comes, we wouldn't get completely overtaken. And this is Riel's perspective in, when, when in his writing, there were, which is just beautiful. There are two societies who treated together. One was small, but in its smallness had its rights. The other was great, but in its greatness had no greater rights than the rights of the small. Isn't that just a wonderful concept? That's, that's what he's thinking that he did with this giant monster of Canada that's coming westward, that they negotiated a treaty 
a treaty based on relationships. So this is what Sir John A. writes in his, uh, to one of his drinking buddies in his diary. It will require considerable management to keep those wild people, to keep those wild people quiet. That's all you in the room. <laughs> just, so, just so you know. In another year, the present residents will be altogether swamped by the influx of strangers who will go in with the idea of becoming industrious and peaceable settlers. Not industrious and peaceable settlers, murderers, rapists, uh, with military force behind them. That's what happens following 1869-70 and the reign of terror that leads to the diaspora in, in the Red River and Métis never getting that promise. Now, this is actually the quote. I love that this is actually quoted by the Supreme Court of Canada. They don't go on to, into how nefarious, deceitful, and truly sharp this is. They say, oh, well, what accidentally happens is delay. That's what the colonial court could accept. But I want to tell you the facts were there to show fraud, deceit, outright lies, and duplicity on the, ha on the part of Canada's prime minister. But what, it, what, it was, uh, what the f case was allowed to proceed on is, and there was a reason why, um, there, they, they d deliberately did not allege sharp dealings or fraud. Because I don't think a Canadian court can allow themselves to come to that and say that publicly and still hold those white settlers to say th that, that that court has not just gone completely AWOL. But I think that, that it's important to highlight that's what the facts of history show in Manitoba Métis. And of course, what the Manitoba Métis did, same thing of that you know this script issue. There will never be reconciliation without dealing with the script issue. For the Manitoba Métis, without dealing with Section 31, there is no way reconciliation would happen. In 1981, they send um, their letter, their land claim to Canada. Canada writes back, please find and close your government's response to your land claim submission as prepared by our legal advisors. You will note it's their considered opinion that the claim as submitted does not support a valid claim to law, nor does it justify the grant of further thing. I love that it's a, theirs is a considered opinion as opposed to you know uh, others who who uh, who is less than. But in particular, the good thing about Canada's uh, learned advisors is they're consistently wrong. And um, what the MMF does is they file the MMF claim. And it's all about getting to negotiating a modern day land claim agreement with Canada to address a historical wrong. And of course, their learned opinion from 1981 is, is overruled in 2013 when the court says the federal crown failed to, Im the federal crown and, and this is imp important. It's the federal crown, not um, the, the provincial crown, failed to fulfill the promise um, in the Section 31 of the Manitoba Act in accordance with the honor of the crown. So what's your promise? Your constitutional promise and your starting point is in the 1870 order and that those equitable principles, um, be, and, and, and why we are looking towards a, the constitutional promises, the way that the MMF case doesn't fall on latches, mootness, limitations, and all those games that they play, is they say, this is a constitutional promise in section 31, and all of these usual reliances of, hey, we changed the law afterwards, we stole it fair and square, they can't rely on because Canada's constitution cannot be overturned or ignored. And in MMF, they say, as the guardians of the court of the constitution, we will even this. And you can't play the game of too bad, so sad. This is old. We don't want to talk about it anymore. If it's embedded in the constitution, that that it requires um, the court to deal with it. And that it, the promise is, is that upon transferring of those territories and that the Métis Nation homeland was in, uh, Canada, the claims of the Indian tribes to, for, to compensation for lands required for the purposes of settlement will be considered and settled in conformity with the equitable principles that have uniformly governed the British crown in its dealings with Aborigines. And Zach from uh, our firm tomorrow is going to talk about the thing. There is nothing 
equitable in what was done in the script system. You've just seen a little bit of, I, I, I love D Dr. Tuff's previous one, calling them the X-Files, because it was uh, uh, of, of all of these things. Th this is just the tip of the iceberg when you look at the dishonor of the crown. I, al I also want to, I want to patent kind of the, I call it the honor of the clown often, because it's actually so incompetent of trying to cover up their wrongs, it's almost clownish. But I think that th this is the constitutional promise that Métis are on. And, and President Patra talked about this timeline, about how all of these things are fitting together. And it's all about clearing the West for settlement and a giant land laundering scheme that Métis are just a cog in the wheel of. There, because, because what gets disconnected, and I find, and it's amazing, when every time I see Frank's presentation, I see something new because what it just is, is see all of this kind of organizational, administrative, bureaucratic nonsense, right? Paper, creating paper, categorization. What they're missing is what the promise is. It's disconnected, and that's going to be the problem because for them when they finally, when they have to deal with the, the script case. Because the same thing within Manitoba Métis. Canada produced a ton of paper that shows, hey, we gave the 1.4 million acres, but it never actually got into the hands of how it was intended. And that's going to be the question and the, that they're going to need, in particular because this is a constitutional promise, um, not written on the back of a napkin. Although they treated it like it was written on the back of a napkin. This timeline of organization of the, the Métis Settlement, uh, sorry, of the, um, the Dominion Lands Act and all of this, and what is absolutely clear is that that system failed to provide any adequate compensation or lands for one of the indigenous peoples of Canada. And that is going to be the test that Canada is going to have to meet. It's not going to be a question of, well, show us the paper. It's going to show, show us how they are today. They're dispossessed, denied, and in this uh, state. And we all have to recognize part of the harms and the ills about whether it's our loss of language or whether it's about the socioeconomic conditions is all about land. It's all about when a people are dispossessed to, from land, we know this happens. It's a cause and effect. And, that, and, and what that fundamental breach is, vis-a-vis -vis the constitutional promise, is what creates today. Now, what the task is, and I'm going to close up now, is this is not known in the Canadian conscience. Some of you probably in the room may not have heard about some of these parts today or how this fits in. And your task is, I think, twofold. One, I think you got to sue the government. <laughs> That's, uh, th there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. But more importantly, you have a task to, tr make, to not let this narrative be lost, to make Canada uncomfortable with the fiction that is Canada, to tell these truths, because if you don't do it, no one will. In the same way as La Rondelle and Arcans and those names that you see, and they tried to do it, and you need to do it together. You need to organize together because one voice out in the wind, they can steamroll over them, buy them off, ignore them, wait until they die. But when you're, you have strength in numbers of that collective claim, and I, and I think that that is fundamental to where you're going. And I think the other thing that you have is there is a new generation of communications around how we tell this story. And I think that we need to use that more because I think that, I, I don't think that some, some settlers will be absolute denial of it. Never, we can't accept the premise that of that somehow we would be getting operating on fraudulent lands. Well, it's the truth, deal with it, suck it up, L you know, let's begin the next discussion. But I also think that there is a, a spot of this has to be a part of the discourse. It's not in your history books about explaining what script did and how these things link together. And it's the, your job to make sure that people understand that. And, and whether it's even just so your children understand it, our grandchildren understand it, future generations understand it and it's not lost, or whether it's to try to educate the broader public, because part of this game also is to make sure the political understanding is there while, while the court case proceeds. I think that, that that is the fundamental task, because I go back to my 
I've got a lot more slides, but I always I ramble on way too much. It's that it's I, I am a wild person. I, I admit my name is Jason. I'm a wild person. Um, so the 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 whole the whole thing that I think is necessary though is to figure out how do we take that to the next level and how do we educate ourselves, but also broader, the broader Canadian public, because that, that is fundamental. And that's also what this conference is about. Part and parcel of it, of it is the legal claim and the leverage that you need to do. And we need to talk about that. And we also need to have a, have a discussion about, well, what does land mean to Métis in the 21st century and ongoing? How do we see this? How do we make our governments more relevant to their people again? How do we ensure that they're authentic and durable and consistent with Métis legal orders as opposed to fighting over uh, bylaws, um, which it just seems obscene, right? When you kind of look at, the, when you read the laws of the hunt or the laws of the prairie and where we are today. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done, but in this age of having a, a government that is willing to negotiate, but also in supposedly the era of reconciliation, this, this discourse needs to happen. And we can't shy away from the Métis land issue. And, and it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be a hard fight, but it's fundamental to reconciliation. And I, I, I label it that as the First Nations in British Columbia have always been very good at saying there is the Indian land issue in BC. There are not historic treaties here. You have to deal with it. And they have and that has fueled into the public discourse. In Western Canada, and I have to admit, it's a bit racist than more uh, than other parts of Canada, more racist than other parts of Canada on some of these things that isn't permeated into the idea that these are First Nations and Métis lands that you settlers are on today. It's, it's, there's some, you know, pablum sort of acknowledgements, but what does that mean, right? What that means, and when you see the social economic disparities, is not because we're less than or somehow we're just less sophisticated. It's because you infected us with the virus, and this is cause and effect. And that needs to be explained because I think that what people don't understand is draw those connections in that way. So looking forward to the next uh, day and a half. Thanks very much. So thank you very much, uh, Audrey and Jason. So we're going to take some questions. Um, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> um, Jason, you uh, did a fine job uh, over the years <clears throat> working for the Métis Nation of Canada and Alberta. And I also want to thank the Council of the Métis Nation and Audrey and her crew for working on this land issue. But one thing was never mentioned here today. How we're going to get our land back. And I know how, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a boss in this world, eh? And I don't think God is going to make any more land. So this is very important. Let's ask him for his help. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh... Hi, my name is uh, Cindy Latticer. I'm from the Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement. I'm uh, wild also. <laughs> I'm a savage because I am a descendant of a savage. Um, and now we are Métis people and maybe we're called Métis people to calm us down a little. Um, I'm glad to be here. This is a very touching into the heart thing that's happening to us 
right now, all this information. Um, one of the things I would like to know is that 49th parallel is also dividing our people. And is there something that's happening that ties us together with those that are across the border? So, so <clears throat> I'll say a a absolutely, and, and I can just talk from the, the litigation and the historic record. There is no way you can tell the story of you know, the Métis in Manitoba without going into the northern United States. You cannot tell the story of you know, the Métis nation without talking about the relatives and the relations that existed historically and continue to exist south of the border. It is, it is very, it, it's one more of those you know, external things being imposed on indigenous peoples, and it almost becomes like an iron wall um, because south of the border we have uh, Métis communities that are recognized as Indian bands down there where Machif is alive and, and spoken, um, whether it's Turtle Mountain or uh, other, other uh, Rocky Mountain band uh, or others. I, and and that, that, that I think speaks to the peoplehood. I'm not sure of anything that's kind of looking at that, uh, you know, or at politically at the national level of kind of uh, rehabilitating those relations. But I, I can say you can't, you know, th those relations are there. The narrative, um, and I think, you know, why, uh, you know, when you look at where the Métis Nation homeland is, it includes those locations. Um, but I, I also, you know, they, they live under a very, you know, different colonial imposed legal regime in comparison to what, what we're attempting to kind of do and even try to keep our own nationhood together with provincial boundaries uh, imposed upon us, which uh, are fundamentally, you know, e each and every one of the cases that I've, I've, I've been a part of, you can't talk about Turtle Mountain without talking about Capel. You can't talk about Capel without talking about Cypress Hills. You can't talk about Cypress Hills uh, without, you know, and I just want to say this, without talking about the Métis settlements. Because one of the things that I loved that came out in some of the history is that how the settlements come to be and where the people from the settlements come is that people are actually writing from the north down to their families after the buffalo are collapsing and saying, come up here. You can trap, you can hunt, you can, th these are the same people. They're not different people. And in fact, in the evidence in these cases, what you're seeing is that Métis movement is fundamental and that's why we say it's a people and it's able to coalesce and have a distinctive identity as a nation and not just be a set of adjunct communities, but instead a people as, as, as Riel refers to it. So that's my long-winded answer to, unfortunately, I don't think that there's, there's kind of that, that reunification uh, happening um, just yet, unless, unless there, President Potter knows of things that I'm, I'm not aware of. Actually, I probably, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Actually, I probably don't know of things that he's not, but I do, I do agree with you that, um, you know, for families, we certainly have family members that are across those borders, and I think they want to, as much as, as much as we look at our land issue and say we have to do something about it, I think they say, they think the same about their identity, but the way it is right now, it, as I visit with them, it's like, we can't do nothing about it. That's the way it is. So I would hope that if we are able to do things to get to what we're talking about today with land, that it will encourage our, our people across the border to say, we can do something too. Okay. okay, we'll take another question in this room. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Elmer Wani Andy. I'm from up in Fort McMurray, and uh, I'm a Métis from up there in 1935. And I heard some things here today, and I'm wondering now, you guys are talking about trying to get some land and this and that. Okay, you get the land. Does that mean that you're going to be paying taxes on this land, or you're going to get the land and tax free where you don't pay nothing on it? You own the land. That's the only way to go, because if you're going to start getting land and have to pay for it later on, there's no reason why you should have that land. 
because it don't belong to you. No land belongs to anyone anyways, because when you buy a house, you don't own that house. You gotta pay taxes for the rest of your life and you pay for that house 10 times over. And you don't own it. If you can't work to supply yourself with the needs, then they take it away from you. So that goes for the land. If you, if you go and get land from the government, be sure that he's gonna to try to tax you or something on that land that you're paying for it. So don't think that you own anything. We've been fighting for land, I know. Métis have for years and years, way before my time, and they still haven't got it because they won't come together. The government gets them separated. They separate the people, and the people aren't smart enough to come together as one. You gotta come together as one, otherwise it's not gonna work. Sorry to say that, but that's the way it is. Hi, hi. That. And that, that's why, you know, when, when you actually look at how Manitoba Métis were able to mount a 32-year fight that cost over $8 million to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, just, just, just think about that, right? And they could have never did it if they didn't actually act as kind of this space shuttle, I, I sometimes refer to, you know, colonialism as gravity, to try to push through that and they did it collectively and also what what is you know the in mmf the claim is recognized as the claim that survives is the collective claim not the individual claims um, i will say that in the modern day land claim agreement negotiations and settlement lands being provided those are provided and taxation they don't need to pay taxes on it subsequent the challenge that you're going to have is in Alberta, there's not lot much land left on some of these, uh, you know, in some of these areas that you want. Um, and also, First Nations have had treaty promises broken to them in relation to land promises to them. And there is challenges there. I do think, though, th and, and, and that is the quintessential, well, we'll get the land back by virtue of, okay, well, now you have to pay the taxes on it. And, and we've seen that movie before as well. I think it's going to have to be fundamental that those lands, uh, you know, need to not, you know, just be in fee simple, uh, where taxes then are subsequently paid, but that they can never be transferred or leveraged or mortgaged uh, and lost again by the Métis. And I think that that has to be fundamental to the negotiations. I also think that you have to have a discussion about how do you protect these lands in different areas, whether it's Faust, whether it's Moccasin Flats, whether it's Cadott Lake, whether it's Lac La Biche, whether it's Saratoga Park, the rescinded settlements of, um, of where, where those lands are, because they each have their own unique story that is a part of the larger Métis Nation story. And I think you need to ask the question about, okay, well, do we frame the claim based upon script to then get to a table and then talk about all of those things? Or do you advance it in kind of more of one of these specific narratives? Because they all have the same story, right? Uh, they, you know, someone else, well, Canada wanted the land or Alberta wanted the land. They pushed indigenous people out of those lands and, um, and that's how they acquired it. And I think that all of us come from communities, mine included, of you know that half-breed adhesion 20 minutes after it was signed of saying, well, no, 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 no. you got to either become Indian or you're white, and there's nothing here for the half-breeds anymore, which seems a little peculiar after it's called a half-breed adhesion. Um, but the point being is you need to understand how those things fit together and develop a strategy on it, because it's not the same type of narrative that you see in Manitoba, which is that square province, and where there's not distinct histories. I've, I've been to the piece, I've been, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Lac San Anne, whether it's, you know, Wolf Lake, they are connected stories, but you also can't usurp the distinctiveness of those communities. You know, as President Patra said, those 31 locals came together to kind of build the MA previously based upon there being similarities between the stories and being the same people, but they also have very specific needs as well, and you need to respect that and appreciate it. Um, as, and I think there is strength in numbers, but those strength in numbers also has to respect the diversity that exists within um, the Métis Nation of Alberta as well. We'll take another question. Good morning. 
My name is Billy Gibos, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact. Uh, first of all, I could probably stand here all day, but I just want to say a couple things. My grandpa and my great-grandfather went through the resistance and uh, through experience, I believe we, our generation, is the sleeping giant and we're waking up. And one of the things that I can honestly and truthfully say here is that I always like to practice encouragement and anyone that stands within two feet of me is gonna hear about the Métis people. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you do, and some of the Métis people that I talk to, I don't even know they're Métis people, and they say, it's okay, I'm Métis. So they understand that. And the last few meetings that I've been to, of all the experiences across this country, if you took a Métis from Ontario and a Métis from BC, they experienced the same traumatic experience all across. And it wasn't easy, and it's not gonna be easy. And while I'm on the topic, I wanna to congratulate Audrey for, for being elected again, which is good to hear. And my uh, beautiful wife here, Laura, she uh, instilled something in me one day that made sense, is uh, we as a nation, we don't believe in fighting because we know it's ours, and they believe in fighting because they know it's not theirs. <laughs> Go ahead. Good morning. My heart is full as I listen and watch what's going on here today. It's been a long journey from the 30s and 40s when I first realized that I was different. We're shunned, but most of all, I'll always remember my dad very strong in his beliefs, values and principles that he taught us as children. Someday, someday we will be recognized. There will be meaty people, half-breed people, <coughs> taking the helm and leading us, leading our people into a better future. I stand here proud today as I look back and realize and live the rights of a Métis person. Through the hard work of many people, our ancestors, where are we today? We have a wonderful leadership that has led us for 23 years here in Alberta. We have achieved a lot. Through her hard work and commitment, we enjoy we enjoy the life that we're entitled to. I have worked after losing so much. I have worked over 50 years to promote, enhance, and honor our unique and very proud Métis heritage. Every one of you here, I know, feels the way I do. Your presence here speaks for itself, that so I want to know more. But it's not only coming here and listening. You gotta go out there, out there, and help, and help our president and her, and her staff and her board. Nobody works alone. And by doing your share, you are adding to what our forefathers left us. Today is a start again because you know, we all know the very foundation of our nation is the people. Every one of you has something to contribute, special gifts that enhance our, the, very, the very foundation of our nation. I have, I have traveled 
and I have worked with many, many of you in this room. I have learned from you. I have, you don't know how much I appreciate what you do just by being you. A smile, a handshake, a hug can make a big difference in people's lives. At this time, I want to thank our president, also all our leaders, but most of all, I want to thank you. Because without your voice, where will we be? Our president needs our support. We have, and appreciate, appreciate what she does. We forget to say thank you. Most of all, as me T, we know the meaning of trust, responsibility, and love. And I know that we're looking, moving forward to a better, better future. And we need to stand up, but we need to work together. And someday, we will get back everything that we have lost because you have the desire and the vision to move forward. And let's do it because there's no better time than now. And I want to tell you that I love you all. Let's march forward together, support each other, and most of all, let's build that trust and that's, please, I, I urge you, let's work with our president and share our knowledge and experiences that make us make our nation great. We, you're the only ones can do it. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. I love you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so do we have any questions uh, from the Glacier Room? Or are we frozen over there? <laughs> Any questions from the glacier room? No? Any questions uh, from uh, the Facebook uh, page? Uh, yeah, we have one coming in from Marcel Auger asking, are we ever going to get the script of our grandfathers and great-grandfathers? So. I'm, I'm not sure that you're going to get it in the way that script was conceived, but I, I'm not sure you want it that way. You know, script in and of itself, is implicit within it is individual land grants and a premise that, uh, uh, that I think fundamentally goes against what the promise is to indigenous peoples around having a collective land base, but also uh, I, 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 don't think that, I don't think that you're going to be able to do that. I, I do think, though, similar to the MMF's case, is saying there's an outstanding promise here, there's a breach here, and you have to negotiate what a resolution is. I'm and, and but and, and script is essentially a, it, it goes to that colonization. It's a construct created by the colonizer. It is it, it, and and now we hold it, and it's a part of our cosmology and our narrative but we have to understand what it actually is it's it's the virus right it is it is it is not the answer about how we actually preserve ourselves as a people going forward for generations to come it's something that was devised as a means to get as as frank articulates lands in the hands of others not in the hands of us so i think i think script is uh you know not going to you know provide the answer to it but i think it is it is part of the the way forward. Any other questions from uh, the Facebook uh, page? Uh, yeah, Lori Blatz, are you saying the Métis cannot sue for land collectively? No, I'm saying the exact opposite. I think that I think that you would have a challenge. Uh, so, so let me be clear. I think that you would have a challenge if. 10 Métis individuals went forward with their script claims and said, here, we have an outstanding claim, S similar to what, as Frank outlined, they tried to take to the Supreme Court of Canada. If you think they were out of date back then, you're way out of date now. What does survive, though, is the collective claim flowing from what we think is the breach, you know, uh, from the 1870 order 
but but more importantly, just the breach from I don't know international law and and conscionability that there could be an indigenous people that doesn't have a land base, right? It just it is it it, it it's absurd. So I, I, I that's what I'm saying is it has to be framed as a collective claim in order to get over some of the uh, what would be the words? Well, the colonial courts uh, obstacles of latches, mootness, limitations, etc. That's how the MMF was able to succeed in their claim, which flows from 1870, and uh, and not be gummed up by uh, obstacles thrown thrown against that claim. And and I do want to say one of the things that does come out of the MMF claim is all of the individual claimants, like they named the individual claimants, and then they had the MMF listed as the representative of the collective. All of the individual claimants failed in that litigation. The only thing that survived was a breach of the honor of the crown in relation to the collective claim. And that's what MMF is negotiating on. Um, you know, and as I said, as a Section 35 practitioner, I'm part of the fictions, but this is what the case law, you know, shows. And I think that that, and, and I think Zach will speak about it and others will speak about it um, more tomorrow when they talk about the mechanics of what a potential claim would look like, that is going to be key. And also, I think that that is somewhat right. I, I, I don't think that people were looking at for lands in some ways just for themselves. They were seeing about, well, how do we protect our communities? Part of that was also, yes, we may have a different land tenure systems. And what I think the Supreme Court of Canada got wrong and twisted on the MMF is just because you have, indigenous peoples don't have to be unsophisticated, not having land tenure systems either. What they saw is, oh, well, because you didn't hold it as just like this communal sort of thing, you had river lots, you had, hey, those families go there. So did First Nations. When you look at trap lines or headmen's, there, we had systems of organization as well. They're not lesser than, and because they actually may have had concepts of individuality in them, does not mean that the underlying title or interest isn't collective that's the BS part of M of the MMF case that the um, that the uh, Supreme Court of Canada creates and it's a fiction um, one of the multitude of fictions that you know come out of the section 35 case law that being said it, it I don't think that you want to advance a claim based on the individual claimants um, because this has always been about the people the communities and 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 the collective Thank you, Jason. Um, we'll take the last uh, question. Thanks, my name is Nadia Burke. I'm from Lac La Biche, Alberta. I'm a member of Region 1 and also of, um, Blair Short, uh, also a member of Kikino Métis Settlement. Um, thank you, Jason. I just want to thank you, first of all, for summarizing an entire colonial history in 20 minutes. That's the <laughs> best I've ever heard it summarized. And if you could just go across and tell that story to 10 million people, we would be on our way. <laughs> I can tell you, it's, I don't, this is a receptive audience. I have presented this in other locations. I have been chased out into the parking lot. Um, um, I want to just mention how um, it's so nice to hear um, Audrey and you talking about the history of the resistance of our leaders and that, um, that continuous history of organizing when we have to and, and being aggressive and in some in a lot of cases, um, previous leaders having to pay that price to do that with their own lives. Like, it's a big cost to us, right? So I'm thinking about everything I heard, and we find ourselves here today as an MNA, as a Métis Nation, and we're, we're signing and we're working with the province and we're working with the federal government because I believe we need to. But I wonder how um, it puts us in a tight spot in terms of making a land claim. It, it, I, don't, I wouldn't want your job, is I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> but my question is, um, whose responsibility is it to take this forward? Like, is, because we were just chatting at our table, and I'm like, is it the Métis Nation's responsibility? And I don't know who else could afford to take it forward, actually. Um, is it our, whose responsibility? And, and our, do you think that we're ready? collectively, because I think that p plays a big part. And I had one more question. Um, 
And where are we in that process right now? Because I know there's, there's, I'm out of the loop on a lot of things, but I know there's been things going on in Ottawa with the MNA. So where are we in terms of that process of, you know, reconciliation? Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. So I, I will say, I totally believe we're ready. I believe that we have to do it collectively. Uh, we need to all stand together and know that it's the right thing to do. And I look at, and I say, I think today we have, yeah, we have both governments that we're working with. We have Canada who has committed. We all know we're going to elections very shortly in both areas. So who knows what's going to happen, but I'm always of the belief that we do what we can while we can and do it as good as we can because who knows what might change. But I also want to say that for me, I think we have right now, we have lawyers, we have historians, we have researchers, we have what are all those other people called that contribute to, to doing all that good work that we have. And I think that has been building over the years to the point where it now takes all of us. If we all stand together, I believe we can move. We can move mountains. We can get to where we need to be. Whatever that may look like, I'm not the expert to say what, you know, I mean, Jason explained how there's different ways of pushing different, whether it's from a legal perspective or whatever it is. But I think for us, as Métis people, the biggest thing that I find is every time we try to do something, whether it's one or whether it's 10 people, somebody sends a letter out there to stop things. It doesn't really stop it, but it slows it down. And in lots of times, we don't have a lot of time to slow down. Like right now, I believe, again, I'm going to say because of the elections, we have Canada who over a year and a half has come from never having an agreement with, with the Métis Nation of Alberta to signing an MOU, to signing a framework, to setting up Section 35 tables where we actually can talk about rights. That's never happened in the past. So I think we have opportunities right now that we really, really need to push on. And I say that because I think all around us we have those experts that are going to help us get there. So I don't know if that gives you an answer, but I think we, I really do believe. Um, and for me, when the last two years after our annual assemblies where we report how we're trying to move forward with the government of Canada, and when I have two different, one a veteran and one a very elderly person that comes and says to me, don't quit. This is where our, what our people have been wanting for how long? This is why it all started. This is why they stood up and said, let's organize. You're getting there. Don't stop now. That tells me we are on the right track. And that I think if we all collectively believe that, we all can make it happen. Thank you. So I'll answer your, your two questions. Who should take it forward? The collective needs to take it forward. Um, and, and, and then the question is, and how, how does the collective take it forward? Um, because this, is, this will be a Herculean effort. And I think, you know, um, the, I know uh, Professor Tuff talked about the Northwest Saskatchewan land claim. I think, you know, what we're gonna talk about over the next day and a half is the MMF case, the Manitoba Métis case, provides a different framework of how that can be done without dealing with the underlying Aboriginal title issues, but, de but saying there was a breach in relation to a constitutional promise and how um, script was negotiated. Now, that's a strategic choice, and, uh, and I think that you, you need to think about that. It has pros and cons to it. I think even at the end of the day, after the Shilkotan Nation won t the recognition of their title, they still had to sit down and negotiate in order to how you operationalize that. And I think there's uh, title claims can get stuck in the mud. And if you think that uh, 
you know, the MMF was a long time and expensive, just dealing with a small title claim in, you know, a, a specific area of, of land uh, in Northwest Saskatchewan has, has been uh, extremely challenging. Um, I also think that one of the things that litigation does is it organizes, it motivates, it gets people behind an idea and behind a fight. And I think that script, as opposed as to, as I, I raised all those different locations, and I probably lit, left a whole bunch of off the list of those different communities of that that are so important. Scrip is something a commonality that brings the M and A's citizenship all together because everyone, I would say by and large, has a story in relation to it, mm -hmm. as opposed to well, I'm from Faust or I'm from you know Wolf Lake or I'm from because they're all symptoms of the disease, right? And the disease is colonization and what the dispossession plays out in very little micro narratives all across Alberta. And not, not one of them is more important or less important than any, any of the other. Scrip though is the mechanism of how they do it, right? Canada, they did it, they set up a fraudulent system and then they stepped out and, and, and uh, left in Alberta's doorstep, and that's how the Métis become the road allowance people, right? And in Alberta, something unique happens, which is quite shocking, uh, you know, back in the day of, of how Alberta politics have somewhat changed, the province steps in, and I, I would love someone to write research of how does that all come about? I've read all of the Ewing reports, but I'd love to understand the politics of why that happens with the, um, uh, with the farmers uh, groups at, that, at, the, at the time. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's a story and research to be done, but I think that, that that's the one thing. Are we ready? Yes. And I, I also think you run into a problem of you now have the prototype from Manitoba Métis of how a potential claim could be advanced. And without kind of putting that in. Now, look, at I'm, I, many people can say, well, you know, we're going to do the negotiations. Um, and, and hopefully those come out, right? But it's also not a bad idea to have a plan B and to also have a, a, a other strategy. Métis have always been very good at triangulating, multilaterally playing the game. Like I read the stuff from the Métis settlements uh, stuff. They were playing those, you know, uh, like, okay, so we need to say that we're really poor and we're destitute and we need help this way in order to get the land. Sure, white people will tell you whatever you need to hear to make yourself <laughs> feel good, but we'll get that land. Right, and I think that Métis have a pragmatism sometimes on how we get deals done um, because we recognize, we see the bigger picture. So th I, I think that all of those sorts of things are, and I think you also have um, two things, an amount of research now um, that may not necessarily have to get all into the different parameters or permutations, because Frank could go on for probably an entire you know month talking about script and it and the deceit that underlies it. I think the general point of that what was the promise and was this breached is is the fundamental question for your case. And it's also I, I just have to say this probably what Canadian courts could tolerate or accept, which is. Okay, this system was the promise was defeated by the system, not getting into the sharp dealing and you know. All, although I would like to have all of these cast of characters, you know, um, <laughs> that that you have up on the slides, kind of put on trial for what they contributed to, which is, I think, the biggest land swindle in North America, and that is what Scrip is. The other fundamental part of this, and I just want to say this to the artists, the writers, the educators, we need to tell this story better so it doesn't get lost. And we need to communicate it in a simplified way so our children understand it and grandchildren understand it because that is fundamental to it as well. Because that needs to, that, that traditional knowledge or that story, that, that part of our origin story needs to be propelled. And everyone has a role within it. It's not just gonna be within the courts. And I'm, you know, I, I'm always in, awed by, we're having amazing stuff come out of taking really kind of boring, lawyerly, 
con concepts into stuff that makes rel is relevant to our own people, that's readable and relatable. And I think that that's important too, because that's how you're going to educate settlers, but you're also going to make sure um, that we, we understand our own story. And also, I want to say, give pride to the next generation. Because this, the, the, we're, we're not these hapless victims. Um, we, this is a system that was systematically, cre that, that was created in order to achieve a certain result. Sir John A, in, in between his, you know, uh, hit in the bottle, was extremely effective in devising systems to destroy indigenous peoples. And those systems still perpetuate today. And I think we need to start making those connections so people understand it, not, and, and not that, oh, well, this is just because we're somehow inferior and have fallen as hapless victims to it. The entire system is set up for us not to succeed, and these are, these are cause and effects. And explaining that cause and effects, I just know from myself and, and uh, you know, uh, seeing my nieces and nephews is, it gives great pride of kind of understanding our story and owning our story as opposed to others. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to kick us off the stage. I'm, I'm well, getting in between myself and lunch. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, break for lunch. Could we get? Could we take your question uh, after the lunch? Or okay, well, go ahead. It's not a question. It's just uh, you know I'm just thinking how a place to start and move forward. Thinking back a little bit, so I think I think we should get all the families that belong to one, meaning the cardinal family. Like say, well, I'll use the cardinal because it's who I am. We find a script that we our ancestors had, and we work on that together, the whole family. And then all others do that. And once we find these findings, then we bring them together and compare our findings. And once we've done that, and how similar they are, how we can go forward together. It's a place we could start by ha having our own family starting, looking back to, in our history of where Scrip is and how it works, how they were frauded. And then we come together and we go as a one with all the same findings. I think that's the only way we will settle what we're looking for, because I think it's very hard when you have people representing you. You got to do it yourself, because when you have people representing you, they're all going on findings. That they're not. They're not really uh, uh, true to their heart. Where when you do it for your own family, it comes from here, and that's the place you win from. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to break for lunch, and we should be back in this room at 1. So lunch is served in the hallway. And also, I think uh, we should let uh, uh, elders go first, and then we can, we can eat. <laughs>